Welcome, you've entered the house of Neshama, hosted by myself, Isa Biza. And me, Adia Rachel. So, what are we doing here? The House of Neshama podcast is a place where we muse over Jewish culture, rituals, and humor. Kvetch about the complications of our own Jewish identities. Yes, and we do so in hopes of sparking necessary conversations and reflections with other Jews across the diaspora. In other words, you can consider this podcast the matzo ball soup for the wandering Jewish soul. And in the soup today, we have a very, very special guest, Yishak Ben Dorit. Yishak is a published writer as well as a proud student of religion, history, and philosophy. They are also someone who is especially dedicated to the struggles and transformations of non-Ashkenazim, Jews of color, as well as non-Rabbinics. In this episode, they'll dive into the history of the Jewish diaspora, the importance of oral storytelling traditions, and what is needed to challenge Ashkenormativity. You'll also hear about how their Ethiopian heritage and Beta Israel identity inspires them, as well as the many, many family members and teachers they have encountered along the way. Yishak certainly plants important seeds and drops all kinds of gems that we hope everyone truly sits and grapples with. Stay tuned. Welcome to the House of Nishama. We're here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're so happy to have you. And we have had the high holy days recently. Um, how have they been treating you? They're wonderful. I'm excited to, hey, I like the days of awe. I'm excited to get into Yom Kippur when it's here. I've been appreciating it. Rosh Hashanah, I, it was simple. It was modest. It was nice. I got to spend it with my mother and my stepfather and um just living, just vibing. And I started working back at this religious school. So we mm. kind of, today we kind of did all of the high holy days in one day because it's wow. weird the way that they schedule everything. So it was pretty interesting. It was chaotic, but you know, they pulled through. That's so good. Also, that sounds intense to put it all in one day. It's it's intense enough in the couple of weeks that we, or depending on what's, you know, what's going on. Oh, entirely. And it was absolutely hilarious because like you're dealing with a group of like sixth and seventh graders and they're all trying to get it done. And it's, it's impressive. They look wild doing it. It's hilarious. So we also were wondering, you know, we read about your work that dives into specifically, and please correct us if we're pronouncing it wrong, but the holiday of Sikh and how much I guess that means to you and like have you been preparing for that or yeah what is that if that looks like anything in particular right now so Sikh is a holiday that I have a very special connection with because it's been part of a lot of other important reclamations in my life and a lot of important establishment in my life as well um it occurs 50 days after the new year and Right now, I'm just, I just have Hishvan the 28th, 29th, like marked for it. Yeah. And I don't really have any plans outside of me and my mom. We usually get together, the two of us, maybe a few family friends, and we're probably going to end up trying to go up to a local mountain and enjoy ourselves with some loved ones. But one thing that I have been thinking about is trying to see if I could possibly reach out and expand my um, community when it comes to sharing tradition. Mm, amazing. Well, we're definitely going to ask you more about that later. But I guess to bring us back to the start, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and, you know, you can include how you might define your Jewish identity and where you're joining us from. My name is Yishak and some might know me as Isaac. I'm currently on occupied Cherokee land and Muscogee land in Atlanta, if I remember correctly. Um, And how would I define my Jewish relationship? For me, it's complicated from the perspective of a lot of times I find myself sitting there thinking, what exactly is Jewish? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I find myself in a position where I may not necessarily, I'm very often not in a position where I'm necessarily 
in agreement with the larger consensus. Okay. So I would definitely say that for me, a lot of my identity is based in my lived experience and my lived reality, as well as the lived experiences and lived realities of people that I've come to know and come to be able to learn from and have a kinship with, um, as well as people who I may not have a kinship with at some times who I might despise, but I still find it important to be able to expand who you are as a person. I would say that my Judaism, as of late, I've a lot of questions on what exactly that even looks like. I've had questions on even what to call it, frankly. But I would say that the best way of being able to describe me and being able to describe who I am is that my Judaism is something that I definitely feel is a part of me, just like every other part of me. I feel like it's inseparable and I feel like it's an active force. For me, it's very connected to the diaspora. I very much so identify with being a member of the diaspora especially given my identity as an African um, and as a Black person. And I would say that my Judaism has been mostly influenced through the traditions that I grew up learning from my grandfather and from my loved ones, primarily Ethiopian traditions. And though there were some other traditions that were included, a lot of what I learned from community as well in synagogue. So I would definitely say that it's this mixture of Ethiopian, Sephardi, Mizrahi, Ashki, like it's, it's a mixture. Yeah. Someone were to mm -hmm. force me to say, like if we were in a synagogue and someone were to ask me where, like denominationally speaking, right. um, I would say conservadox. If someone were mm -hmm. to, um, conservadox who thinks that the, um, Reconstructionist movement is doing a pretty good job. Um, mm. And um, I would definitely say if I'm not in such a formal environment, I would say that it doesn't necessarily exist anymore. But that being said, it's not to, that's, it's not fair to say that it doesn't exist at all because there are people trying to keep it alive. My Judaism is something that's still evolving even right now. Recently, I've been blessed to be invited into this into a space where I get to learn from a hakam, which is a tradition, um, traditional Sephardi Judaism that is a spiritual leader who you go to to learn the rabbinic tradition from. And one of my friends says, so one interesting thing is that I've been straight up relearning biblical Hebrew. I've been wow. relearning um, yeah, yeah. They, it's some serious stuff and I'm also like sitting here and it's it feels like a crossroads I feel like I'm personally at a crossroads of Jewishness because on one hand I come from Ethiopian tradition and there's the reality of even though it's something that's not really spoken of in the community and it's something that is very much so tied to politics there's the reality that like Ethiopian Judaism is more closely related to Samaritanism than it is to rabbinic or even K-Rite Judaism. Mm. There's the reality that when you're looking at the older diasporas in Africa, in Asia, um, and in Europe, but not to the same extent because a lot of the rabbinic works ended up getting through certain parts of the Middle East and Europe faster than it did to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. There's like this reality when you look at communities in Ethiopia, when you look at communities in Yemen, Kurdistan, in um, Malabar, India specifically, um, the Maghreb, and you see the fact that like, and it's very much so also tied into identity in, in relation to Midanat, um, in relation to the um, state and the reality of it being a situation where you have this identity that in a lot of cases, a lot of these Jewish communities in certain ways predate Judaism um, because these are communities that 
very much so largely, especially when you look at Ethiopia, Yemen, Kurdistan, the Maghreb and Malabar, India, these are communities where there's where like our stories are that we arrive sometimes five, 600 years before people were calling themselves rabbi, much less before people had completed the Talmud. So there is this reality of like, you have traditions that are influenced by the groups of people that we've been around in diaspora. And the fact that a lot of the cultures that we've been around have been inextricably changed by us just as well. And I apologize, mm. I should have mentioned Afghanistan as a region as well, mm. um, because that's a that's an area with an extremely um, ancient community as well, yeah. as well as um, Greece. And we were wondering, like, are there any stories behind your Hebrew name? What is like the relationship that you have with it? And wonder if you could share like a little bit about that. So my Hebrew name is Yishak, um, and well, Yitzhak Yishak, and I get it from my grandfather's father my great grandfather Mm -hmm. and his generation they fled ethiopia for me it's funny because i feel an extreme connection to it i'm a very boisterous laughing individual jovial type of person i i try to be at least like i have my Mm -hmm. ways about me but i like to i like to keep it jovial and um it's something that I remember, I don't remember where I heard it from. I'm probably going to say it and people are going to be like, that's Fiddler on the Roof or something. <laughs> um, but like, I remember watching this thing at some point in my youth and this like old Ashkey man in it said something around the lines of, I fall down, I get up, but um, no matter what, I'm still dancing. Mm. I love that. That's beautiful. And also, it's a relationship with your family, too, because you said that, like, you know, your family was involved in this this story. Entirely. And, like, hey, what can I say? Like, we name people after, we most often name people after past um, loved ones. Yeah. But I would also like to posit this, too, when it comes to, like, religious names, even though culturally now it's more common to go with a Hebrew name, historically, they have not always been just in Hebrew. Say more. Very often, it wouldn't be uncommon for communities to have the child's name being in Aramaic mm-hmm. or even in another language that might be a regional tongue. Yeah, yeah. Well, on a similar note before, when you, you brought up your grandfather, what we were wondering, and I guess however it may connect, what first started to inspire you when you were writing about your Jewish identity? Because at, at least, yeah, we knew that like he had this presence or like the story, maybe there's examples of stories that you were told that made you want to tell your own or pass them down to others. Um, yeah, if you can kind of paint a little bit more of a picture of what that looks like for you. I come from a family of teachers. We've taken up roles of being educators. And I would say that for all sides of my family, that's something that's extremely important, but especially my mother's side. Um, And one of the things that inspired me most about him, well, is like, he was a mountain of a man and he was a gentle giant. He was a mountain of a man. In some ways he was a man of his time, but like he was the type of person who made himself known i guess is the best way of describing it like he just straight up did not care a lick on any level when it came to anyone trying to sell him any type of jive and he was amazing for it um he taught in new york city public schools and him and my grandmother taught there from the 70s until the early 2000s and Just the fact that I got to sit at their feet and learn from them, just whether it have been from hearing stories about how there were nights when my grandmother would have my mom and her sisters and her brother, like, help her make lunches so that they'll be able to give them to the kids in her class. Um, Or whether it would be a situation of my grandfather sitting me down and telling me about like some legend that he grew up with, like Duhu Nuas, which was a Yemeni um, Jewish king of um, king of Hemyar. And just like for him, it was so important, especially in relation to like the realities of experiencing violence. Yeah. 
not just on a racialized level, not just on ethnic level, just the reality of, of race, ethnicity, nationality, the reality of being an African person, of being a Black person, of being a Jew, of being someone who is from the global South. Like all of these compounding realities and the fact of the matter being like, it isn't perseverance, it's more than that, it's establishment. It's being able to create something with some lasting effect and just being able to, and just thinking about the ways that he imparted onto me, the way he taught me about Jewishness and being a Jew was like through education. Um, and he was old school. I didn't grow up going to Hebrew school. He was mm -hmm. old school and old school, old, like old school Sephardi style was like you grow up and your parents are the ones teaching you, which is a thing that like in a lot of Jewish communities outside of Ashkenazi communities, specifically ones in the global North, like America and less violent climates of Europe and other um, settler colonies. It's a situation of Jewishness so often being something that just stays in the classroom except yeah. for some holidays. And Absolutely. it's something that like I find myself personally opposed to ironically though I am a teacher but that's one of the reasons I'm opposed to keeping it only in the classroom mm. I try to impart on my students the fact that they need to continue with this relationship the fact that it does like you don't have to be in synagogue all the time do, do Judaism the way that you see it but there being such an importance and such a value on the being able to keep the knowledge amongst ourselves so that anyone everyone has the right to know, even if you're not able to achieve certain amounts of education, because historically, like outside of the fact that a lot of texts were barred based off of sex discrimination, it right. also being a situation where if you didn't have a sponsor or you didn't come for money, right. you're um, out of luck too. The way that he told you these stories, like through oral storytelling, or was there a specific story that he shared with you that really impacted you? How much does that have an influence on you in your relationship with Judaism or just in general as a person? Oral tradition, I, I'm a student of history and of philosophy, and I'm a diasporist, I'm a Pan-African. Oral tradition is something that I fully support on every level. I feel like the devaluing of oral tradition is colonial at best and that's saying and that's saying it nicely and oral traditions that I was able to glean from him as well as other people throughout my life have impacted my Jewishness entirely and irrevocably my grandfather he planted a seed that is still sprouting and I would say that like all of the stories, I don't know which, I can't think of which story, like this man, like what, like the time when he was in Egypt and he tried getting back home, like, because he wanted to see how our family were doing back in Ethiopia, like, which I'm gonna call it, the time that he was working as, um, he was working in a new, he was working in a newspaper and he ended up being able to actually meet one of the people, one of the survivors of the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. The stories that he gave me are more precious than anything else that I can think of. And I can't think of any specific story that changed me more than another one because all of them were beyond profound and I think that one of the things that like he did most that I don't think that enough people especially from marginalized backgrounds get is that he gave me the knowledge of knowing that I'm normal he gave me the knowledge of knowing that the fact of the matter being that those with marginalized identities, not always, but more often because of the reality of the fact that when we're going about our lives, we don't just have our own voices in our head. We have the voices of our society and we have the voices that best to outright wipe you out. I feel like there is an importance of being able to just truly hold on to that. And I especially value it because 
in all honesty, I know a lot of other Black people who, especially living in America, like that is not what we get. I know that's the reality for the majority of, like that's the reality for everyone sitting here, but especially for Black and Brown people. And the reality of like, whether it being upon racial lines, whether it being upon the lines of sex or gender, whether it being upon the lines of ethnicity or religion, very often, if not always having to put on another's shoes. Hi everyone, just a friendly reminder that we now have a newsletter. So if you would like kosher love notes sent from our neshama, full of tasty spillover from our episodes and all sorts of Jewish musings, please see our show description below or visit our link tree via Insta. All right, back to the episode. One of the topics we discussed was Beta Israel and like your relationship with it. And because you were talking about ignorance and we, we want to bring that to light, like maybe you can describe it. Definitely. Beta Israel is the name of the ethnic group that most people know as Ethiopian Jews. And it's an ethnic group. It's also technically our religious, our like the name of our religion too. Mm-hmm. Um, Hamanot, the term that is widely accepted in the Jewish world as the name for Ethiopian Judaism. Actually, funny enough, it me- just means religion and um, Amharic, that's all it means. Oh, wow. So it's, yeah, it's literally just saying religion. Um, religion. <laughs> Bete Israel is very unique from the perspective of, it's a lot more similar to um, Samaritanism, religiously speaking. like. There's the reality of the fact that we still have the Lekha Kahanet, which is our high priest, our head priest, and then we have the Kes, um, who are priests. And these are people, and these are men who come from the line of the um, priestly lines, which is something that the um, Samaritans also still do. They still have their religious officials be Kohanim. Um, and... A lot of our traditions, for example, um, our Oret, which is our Torah as well as Tanakh, has different um, texts than the Mishnah Torah, just like the Samaritan Torah has differences between itself and the Mishnah Torah, because these are all texts that kind of emerged congruently but separately and distinctly while for the Oret uh, in Ethiopia it was lit- written in Giez which is the ancient Ethiopian um, dialect of Aramaic okay. which fun fact Kurdish Jews actually historically and a fair bit of them um, today up until recently um, have also been largely Aramaic um, speaking as well. So Yishak, one thing that I know that you were di- we were diving into at one point in the pre-interview and, you know, I mean, for those of us I mean, like myself, who, who, are, who were definitely ignorant about just the idea of there's rabbinical Judaism and then there's this entire world that exists outside of it. What would you say kind of makes Beta Israel, like all these things like distinct? Um, and I know you've also mentioned like the fall of the sen- second temple as like a reference point. But I guess for those people, yeah, for those of us who just kind of need a little bit of a snapshot of that. No, entirely. And frankly, this is a lot of this history is something that you primarily learn in community with other people, Mm. because unfortunately, when it comes to the world of Jewish studies, it has not reached to this point yet. Um, Yeah. But there's the reality of the fact that you're Beta Israel is distinct because of a variety of factors, mostly because, mostly due to the fact that our community, just like the communities I had listed previously across Africa, Asia, and Southern Europe, had all actually um, arrived in their locations largely before the first temple even fell. Um, you're, so you're dealing with communities that are over 2,500 years old at least. Wow. Um, 
if we're going with the potential time that the reign of David and Solomon were, which for two communities at least, the well, according to potential evidence, three communities at least, those in Ethiopia, Yemen, and the Maghreb, um, around the time they existed, they came into existence, that would have been at around roughly the time of um, King Solomon. And it's funny because you look at Yemeni Jews and you look at Ethiopian Jews and like, we actually, and Beta Yisrael, um, and you look at Yemenites and Beta Yisrael, and it's funny, um, when you look at Tamani and Beta Yisrael, we have the exact same explanation for the reason why our oldest communities are in the land. And that explanation is that they were sent down with, now depending on some people and in the in Ethiopian Jewish spaces, this isn't popular, primarily due to the fact that Ethiopian Christians use it as propaganda, and they mm. wrote it in the Kibra Nagast, which is this like it's a very interesting text, and it has a lot of like legit Ethiopian history. But the issue is that it was written by an Orthodox um, Christian priest with the intention of converting Jews. Um, wow. Yeah, and it was written in like the 1500s if I remember but essentially like there's this explanation for both of the regions because Ethiopia and Yemen East A East Africa and Arabia have always been extremely similar um outside of the fact that like Afroasiatic um Semitic language family there's the reality of like during multiple times in history, we've conquered each other, we've lived in peace together. So one very interesting telling is that our communities came there from um, the, we're, we're sent with the Queen of Sheba. And mm -hmm. one of the tellings is that we were sent with the Queen of Sheba as a diplomatic envoy, and as well, well as trade partners to establish like the Jewish people in that area. Um, mm -hmm. At that point, the Israelite people in that area and then you have the other one that is pretty popular that depending on who you ask if it's more likely to be popular amongst a uh, ethiopian monarchist but there's the one who it said that we arrived there because um we were sent not just with the queen of sheba but also with her and solomon's son menelik but with that with the story of menelik that gets into a whole lot of expanded conversation on Ethiopian ethno-feudal identity. It's interesting, yeah. like one of the things for the Ethiopian empires has been like to be a legitimate claimant to the imperial throne is that you have to be a direct descendant of Menelik because of the way that Ethiopian identity has evolved. Um, because fun fact, one thing that makes Ethiopian Christianity distinct from literally any other Christian group on the planet is the fact that Ethiopian Christians also claim to be descendants of the Israelites. Mm. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Extremely. And this <laughs> comes from the fact that like Beta Israel presence predates Christianity in the region for centuries wow so, yeah under the emperor azana that was the first time there were mass conversions to christianity in the 300s and the 400s so you ended up having largely jewish population like largely what today would be described as jewish but historically would have they would have described themselves as beta israel they would have even described themselves straight up as israelites um yeah populations converting to Christianity as well as the other groups of people in the region who very largely were different groups of Semitic pagans as well as like another interesting fact about Ethiopia, this group known as the Kamant, which they are a group that are shockingly related to us. Um, they are, the way that they've been described as pagan Hebraics. Um, they claim descent from Canaanites. And historically speaking, one of their explanations for how they got to the region is actually 
this the one that I at least grew up with. I unfortunately didn't have the privilege of growing up with somebody of the background, but the way that my grandfather explained them to me was that the way that they arrived was that they were told that they need to be there with their cousins. And I thought that was especially beautiful because like historically in Ethiopia, like there has been this solidarity of non of non-Christians versus Christians pretty much. We love that. Yeah. It's a fun time, whether it's like Beta Israel and we're like fighting alongside pagans and Muslims, or whether it's us getting uh, whether we're fighting successfully against them or whether we're getting curb stomped by them it's usually (laughs) us and whoever else is in the club who doesn't like the fact that they're doing too much but um, exactly right right (laughs) the story of of, yeah yeah the story of and fun fact one thing that ethiopian christians have historically called themselves are beta christ uh, is beta christ um Mm. so they've literally called themselves the house of christ so in response we've called ourselves the house of israel um word okay because it's a better way of like it shows more distinctions and then when you get into that you also get into different groups amongst beta israel that would emerge later but historically one major thing that occurred that I feel like is especially interesting is like up until the last century we had a we had monks which is something that a lot of other Jewish groups did not have um following the destruction of the second temple and it's very interesting because the idea of monks being introduced to Beit Yisrael was in response to a series of campaigns that we had fought against the Christians unsuccessfully unfortunately um Ethiopia actually during the Middle Ages was known for being rumored to have a um Jewish kingdom and it's a situation where this is also a rumor that was talked about in relation to a few other places like for example in the Maghreb um they used to um when you look at medieval texts from the different rulers of like what is now Morocco and mm-hmm. what was then a, a lot like those large Muslim states that were like in North Africa and yeah. um, Spain and Iberia one really funny thing that you see is like them talking about rampaging groups of Jews in the Sahara and wow. it's kind of funny you see similar being described in medieval texts looking, but in relation to it being in the um, steppes and it being situation of it, especially being around the region of um, the modern day Caucasus and a little further up. And you also see similar when it comes to um, Fun fact, Arabia until the 1700s had a very large population of Jewish tribes, um, like a significant one. It wasn't until the rise of Wahhabism where there was a significant push to force them out of the um, region. Right. So there's just this really fascinating thing when it comes to like looking at these developments of all these diverse communities, because one very interesting academic paper I got my hands on recently talks about the gradual Judaization of a lot of groups that are today considered Jews. So you see a lot of these older groups in diaspora that like gradually through trade, through intermarriage, Mm. ended up adopting rabbinic Judaism. And you also see like a lot of these stories about just fascinating Jews across the planet. So like, I'm sorry, I'm going, I'm going. No, no, it's, it's so important. Like this is so important because not everyone knows that there's more, there's so many different types of Judaism. There's so many way approaches and like histories that have been erased and, and we want to bring that to light, like mm-hmm. the fact that not all people 
need a rabbi. There's so many other ways. Specifically in relation to Bete Yisrael, though, our developments have been over the course of millennia and centuries. And I can just really go on and go into the fact that like, when it's come to the modern homogenization of Jewish identity, frankly, and there's a lot of political mo- motives behind that. And I can go very deeply into that. And um, there's just this reality of the fact that like what we are taught as like Judaism is really Judaism's plural. Mm. And even within that plurality, there is the question of like, it's a situation of rabbinic Judaism being the predominant form. There's also Karite Judaism. The differences between rabbinic and Karite being one being from, rabbinic being from Pharisee tradition and Karite being from Sadducee tradition. Um, so it being a disagreement between whether or not um, extra biblical texts are as important and mostly like between oral Torah versus written Torah. And a um, lot of religious changes have occurred over the course of the last century. And a lot of them have been in response to colonialism. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. a lot of them have seen the colonized buried. Um mm-hmm in no uncertain terms and it's a very scary thing from the perspective of like even when it comes to Sephardi Judaism a lot of it has changed significantly to the point where like a lot of its traditional structures straight up don't exist Mm -hmm. and there being the reality of like there's been such a standardization of Jewishness and that standardization including the coercion of groups of Am Yisrael that are technically not Jewish. And one of the things that I think of when it comes to the identity of Am Yisrael is not just what it looks like for Beta Yisrael and what it looks for Samaritans and what it looks like for rabbinic and Karite Jews, but I also think about it from the perspectives of what does it necessarily look like in relation to groups that do not follow Torah Mm -hmm. but they claim descent Mm -hmm. what does it look like for Habisha Ethiopians what does it look like for Pashtun in Afghanistan and the reality of it being a situation of I think that it's important for us to start thinking less within Jewish identity being a confine Mm-hmm. And more within it being a bigger tent, because I feel like very often we see Judaism as the biggest tent. Mm-hmm. And even that Judaism that we're treating as the biggest tent, like it's a standardized Judaism. Mm-hmm. It's a standardized mm-hmm. Judaism that favors traditions that were birthed from Europe, which that right. isn't a bad thing, but it is a situation where like, hey, the chief rabbinates have straight up said that k rights don't count as Jews and they deserve mm-hmm. to be inferior citizens. Like, Samaritans, you're like, Samaritans are Palestinians. Um, mm-hmm. The reality is that, like, they're living under violent occupation. Mm-hmm. I've been... I've been blessed to make community with some Samaritans and I won't divulge their stories, but I will say that they live the lives of a Palestinian. There's just this reality of like Beit Yisrael, our traditions being actively snuffed, like specifically for Jews from Ethiopia, specifically for Beit Yisrael and Bini Yisrael, Um, Jews from Ethiopia and India, like, we're forced to convert to Ashkenazi rabbinic Mm -hmm. Judaism. Mm -hmm. Like, we're forced to convert to be able to go through with marriages. We're forced to convert to be able to do anything. And it's like a situation where, like, the craziest part is that B'nai Yisrael's, they were rabbinic. They were following Sephardi rabbinic. Mm -hmm. Um, the fair um, bit of their community like were introduced to rabbinic Judaism through Syrian Jews centuries ago 
but they're forced to convert because of the fact that we are not considered to be fully Jews for blood reasons. What? Because of the fact that, yeah, because of the fact that we married, like because of the fact that we married out more than others. That's mm-hmm. so sickening. <laughs> Just it's the whole blood literal. divides people. It breeds hate. Like, but it, it's, it's also... I mean, there's so much to just it's blood like white and what it's race science. I was gonna... it's, it's literal white supremacist white race science. No, I was gonna say like there's some similarities here when you're starting looking at blood count of like how close are you to this side or that side, but also yeah, the fact that they're you are. right, and they're also saying exactly. right, your, your Jewish is not Jewish enough. Like your Jewish is not valid. Yes. And like, and it's not just a religious dis. It's not just a religious disrespect. It's like a literal ethnic, racial, Mm -hmm. you existing disrespect. But then, and then, and then there's like a total power dynamic. Like, who decides this stuff? Who decides these classifications? (laughs) It's not God. Like, yeah, no, (laughs) it's it's literally white supremacy. You know, there's like, and again, we have to admit that these things are in our communities. Mm -hmm. They are in our structures. Uh, yeah, and structure. unfortunately, just because you're a target of something does not mean that you're not capable of replicating it. It doesn't justify it. And that's like such a huge thing, too. The fact that people very often treat it as a situation where like you go through a certain amount of trauma and it okays the violence you commit against other people. Oh, we see that all the time. And and I think that's where something that's important within you know what we're trying to do within house of neshama is that you know there's there's a lot of intercommunity conversations that need to happen because as you've already laid out like yeah that runs deep that's not just like we're gonna like resolve within the community different kinds of jews and trauma that was that was created from other jews that's not gonna be like this doesn't disappear in one conversation and we're definitely gonna get more into how do, how do you form community that actually addresses that, that faces it head on, because it is uncomfortable. And people have all kinds of reactions to even wanting to he- to hear those stories. Entirely, and a lot of people respond with outright hostility. But from what I've experienced, you know, there's people who I don't talk to anymore. There's p- places I've been disinvited from. What I've noticed is that when you start asking the right questions and when you start pushing the right buttons, everything comes apart the way it should at the end of the day. One thing that's really big for me, I can't speak for either of your political opinions. I can't speak for House of Nishama as a podcast. But for me, one thing that I have realized is that the Jewish community as it exists is not sustainable for someone like me. And I've spoken to a lot of other Jews of color. I've spoken to a lot of people who are, I've spoke, I've been gifted the community of a fair bit of people who are also non-rabbinic, whether they, I've been able to be in community with some Samaritans, I've been able to build friendships with some k and I've been able to get to build a better relationship with other Beta Yisraelim. Um, and it's such a situation, and even within rabbinic Jews, I've met so many Sephardim. And it's realizing at a certain point that there's too many contradictions occurring in our community right now. Mm. Like, at the end of the day, that's the biggest issue. There's too many contradictions occurring in our community. And we were talking about Jewish trauma and we were talking about Jewish pain. There's this reality of the fact that a lot of times in our community, pain is used as the reason to not actually engage with something meaningfully. Mm -hmm. Very often in our community, pain is used as an excuse. Very often in our community, our pain is given a license to have a power that it shouldn't. Our pain is given the license to okay things that it should frankly be most adamantly against. Right. And at the end of the day, like what has my journey looked like for me? I feel like it's such a situation where 
the writing is on the wall and I've found myself grateful to be given the possibility of making community with Palestinians and other colonized people and just being able to be in community and just realize like the realities of the way that things are going is not going to serve any of us. One of the things we've talked about, um, you know, if if this is even sustainable, like, you know, this idea of like Jewishness and like, because, you know, we do have to be with each other. Like, I mean, we are, there's like Jewish spaces. There are limited Jewish spaces, but, and being like Jews of color, we like, we enter these Jewish spaces and, and personally I feel othered. But maybe like these Jewish spaces can be like held accountable and like so that they can be more inclusive of different traditions like and that are, you know, non-rabbinical or like, like, what do you hope for for that? Personally, what I've been doing is like I've been actively searching for what it looks like to create what's next. And I know that I'm not the only person doing it because there's a lot of people doing it. You have groups like the Kohenets, you have groups like Neo, you have movements like Neo Hasidim, you have, hey, even within rabbinic Judaism, you seem, it seems like there's a new um, denomination every 20 to 30 years at this point. Um, But I know that whatever I'm looking for, and a lot of the people I've made community with as of late, a it doesn't exist, it used to exist. Mm -hmm. And there are people around there who remember it still because I feel like one important thing for people to remember is that the way things are did not exist even when our parents were alive fully. Mm -hmm. The way things are is very recent and it can be undone. Ursula Le Guin had an amazing quote where she said that people once thought that the divine power of monarchs was absolute. And the way I see it is very much so like as a colonized person, as a black person, as an African, as a Jew, the way that I see it is that my people have been going through that through a consistent apocalypse for millennia. Mm. My people have been going through consistent apocalypse for centuries. My people have been going through consistent apocalypse for decades and it's not just my people, but we are told we are told to not let the blood of the innocent to go and to just be shed and for there to be no answering for that. Mm-hmm. And I am someone who my religious beliefs, my political beliefs, my spiritual beliefs, whatever you want to call them. I'm someone who it was instilled in me by the people who raised me to pursue righteousness, to pursue justice, to pursue whatever will be edifying and whatever will be liberating. And that liberation is not full unless it is full for everyone. Hey, I'm a teacher at a progressive religious school and I'm a curriculum writer and I write in general. And I'm not, I'm not afraid to admit the fact that like, I do believe that it's important to impart seeds in your community do believe that it's important. I feel like we all have that one teacher who supported us reading that book when no one else wanted us to. Mm. What should we call it? One of my teachers who I didn't have in the classroom, who I think about very often, is this man that I knew, primarily in middle school and late elementary school, who became a family friend when me and my mother would go to the local Barnes and Noble. His name is Mr. Salman, and he was a Nakba survivor. And I remember I've always been, I've always been fascinated by religion. I've always been fascinated by the concept of the divine. I've always been someone who, since I can remember, I've known that whatever I'm going to do in life, whatever I'm intended for is within that sphere. And I remember that day I was asking my mom for some book about world religions and she was like, you know, it was the recession and she's a single black woman working in the American South. 
so things would be tight. And I remember Mr. Solomon and he just like was sitting there vibing this ancient man. And my mother is the one who really made me notice him because she took back and she was like, why does he look like your grandpa if he was really pale? And I like, and I like looked back and I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, he does look like grandpa if he was really pale. And oh. um, what you gonna call it? We were just like, it was a, it was a rough day. We were missing my grandfather in particular yeah. and we saw him and it was nice. And um, Mr. Salomon was a, I unfortunately haven't had the privilege of knowing him since high school. Um, it's been years since I've, last time I was able to call his number, his daughter had taken him back home to Lebanon, but um. Mm-hmm. And that was like back in ninth grade. So yeah. that was nearly a decade ago in a few years. Um, but well, actually in a year, it's going to be a decade ago. That's wild. But um, he, he sounds like he was an important person in like just finding yourself, you know, and, and the, the, you those teachers mean so much. Like whether they're like, they don't even have to be a teacher, they can be like, you know, a community member that like teaches you something and like leads you on a path and that like it's so important it being very much a situation of like with Mr. Salman like he taught me Islam and we would meet at Barnes and Noble and we would talk about religion together he also taught me about he also taught me about the occupation he taught me about being a three-year-old child who had to flee from his home in Palestine Mm -hmm. on foot and he told me about the pain of himself and his people and his children. And that's something that I've found immense solidarity in and community in. And he's someone who I personally, I don't know where he is. I don't know where his kids are, but he is someone who touched me personally and profoundly who I try to keep, who I keep very close to my heart because of the fact of the matter, like you said, like with these Jewish spaces, like there's a lot of violence that we go through as Jews of color in them. And then that's the tip of the violence for us, in my opinion. I feel like for the community I'm building, like it can't exist with the current structures. It can't exist with rabbinates bent on homogenization. It can't exist with states doing violence in our name. It can't exist with any form of compromise with wronghood. And I feel like that isn't necessarily idealism, but I do think that it's actually questioning ourselves to uphold a standard. It's not about you never, and I think that's one of the things that makes Judaism unique. Our heroes are very rarely flawless individuals. Melech David sent a man to die so that he could steal his wife. Um, There's this reality of the fact that like in Jewish tradition, we'll have some of the most horrifying individuals. Avram um, literally was going to murder his child. And then like, there's been a lot of fascinating feminist re- tellings of that story alone because like how can you like imagine what was going through all of those Jewish mothers minds throughout history Mm -hmm. hearing a man who we venerate in our tradition yeah behave in some of the most we're given that we're given the I feel like not even to be Jewish but to be Am Yisrael to call to a deeper identity to call to our true establishment because I'm going to be real, a lot of groups that even identify as Jewish, like Jewish very specifically was first thing, it was a term used by groups of people who weren't us to describe us. And second thing, a lot of groups that do identify as Jewish, they actually, people talk about the quote unquote 10 lost tribes. They're not really lost. They just legitimately horrifying behavior took on rabbinic Judaism largely, or they took on Karaite, or they took on Karism. 
And the ones who didn't, they either or they might have stayed similarly practicing an Israelite version of religion. So like there's also just this reality of like our identities are extremely complex. And that's such an understatement, especially when you start looking at communities that predate even the foundations of what we're going through right now. So I think that for whatever is to come, it has to be profound. And I think that it has to be profound because we're living in times that are profound. We're living in times that like, heck, even if you don't believe in, even if you're not a literalist about the Tanakh and the Talmud, we're still living in times that are extremely significant for us as a people, even if you're just a straight up secularist, um, never been inside a synagogue, your Jewishness is Barbra Streisand and a really nice <laughs> deli sandwich. Mm -hmm. You can't deny that what's happening now is something that has not happened in millennia. And that that alone and all of the moral and ethical realities looking us in the face, mm -hmm. it's forcing us to push it's forcing us to prove what we are, and that's a living tradition. I have to, like, let that one sit. That's... Yeah. Hmm. We, 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 we like, those lasting thoughts, because it, it, we really want people to think on this and um, really take in what this means, uh, how dangerous this could be in that thought, you know, homogeneity is really dangerous. Um, these narratives that, that one is for everything, you know, it really leaves people out. Um, Ariel, do you, do you want to ask your question? I was wondering, you know, this whole process, I mean, to use the word messy for lack of better word, <laughs> whatever the pursuit is, right? Because all the, our identities, they are complex. And whether as an individual level, but I guess for you, um, what would you say like your, if you were to have some kind of Jewish joy or when we, we like to talk about a little bit about like euphoria, what is it for you that still maybe holds you? And like, what does that look like? Because I hear it throughout the struggle. And I think people love social justice math equations where things have to get canceled out. <laughs> um, but I guess in the meanwhile, while you're, w this work is happening, yeah, what does that look like for you? In the meanwhile, which McCall, I like that you bring up that a lot of people like social justice questions because I've been trying to push myself past those stages because I feel like a lot of us stay there. And I feel like that's valid that a lot of people stay there because it's like a comfortable space. But a friend of mine who is unfortunately no longer a friend, mm -hmm. and I don't know if we would still be friends if we were to meet today, but mm -hmm. that doesn't change that he told me something profound. If anything, it makes it funnier. Um, he told me to lean into discomfort. Mm. and that's something that's become very major in my Jewishness mm. um the idea of leaning into the unknown the idea of questioning the idea of being an active conversation my personal favorite story growing up has been my favorite like story from the Torah has been and will always be the story of how Yaakov became Yisrael and just the reality of like how with Christianity they follow Christ, how with Islam it's submitting to God, it's submitting to Allah, but with Judaism it's wrestling, mm. it's questioning it's being physical it's and that's not and hey it's a fight so sometimes god throws us through the glass door yeah but you know what like, and sometimes god will throw us through the glass door and leave us on the side of the road but you know what it's a fight still and i feel like there is something to that i feel like there is something to the fact that like we're called for that we're called to be in that level of relationship Hi 
everyone! Real quick, I just want to tell you about my longtime project, Neshama the Jewess Soul. It is an ongoing interactive documentary and living, breathing archive that takes a deeply intimate dive into Jewish womanhood in the United States. Told from the voices of Jewish women themselves across a variety of racial, ethnic, and Judaic backgrounds. It's a place for you to hear the unique and eclectic stories, journeys, and perspectives on that crucial topic of what it means to be a Jewish woman. You can see some of the stories featured by visiting neshama.amandapeckler.com. And if you're interested in participating and simply learning more, send us an email at neshama.interact at gmail.com. All right, back to the episode. We want to transition um, to any projects that you have going. Um, so things that, yeah, you, that you think people really should make sure that they read up on and that kind of thing. So I have a wealth of resources. I would say that one group that I've been working with recently is um, Talem, which they're working with, which I'll send you their information. Great. Um, they are a Jews of Color cookbook that is projected to come out in a year or two. Uh, and awesome. um, it's gonna be amazing. I'm doing some of the editing. Alana Chandler is the one who's handling the um the like it's her brain, it's her brainchild, and they're doing absolutely amazing with it. That being said, my personal opinions, everything said here is, are my personal opinions. They do not represent the people I associate with, and but I do stand by my convictions. Um and I do recommend working with them. They are a wonderful Jews of color group. Um, I also have some projects that I'm working on, but unfortunately I'm a pretty hush hush person. I'm currently reading the first um, <laughs> English translated copy of the Samaritan Torah compared to the Mishnah Torah. No big um, deal. Just light reading, light work. <laughs> it's fun stuff. And it's not enough people do that. I'm, I've also been blessed to be in community with a, a hacham through the beauties of the internet who is yes. teaching me traditional Sephardi Judaism, um, yes. as well as some other people. For those interested, I can potentially see if I can get you in contact with him. Um, I would also, I have some Palestinian charities that I would like to recommend that mm -hmm. specifically give to children directly. It's direct mutual aid. And these individuals are people who give directly to children and families who nice. need things like textbooks or um, school supplies, or in some cases, unfortunately, like glasses or more intense medical care. I would just like to, my upcoming projects, I have a few coals in the fire and my next coming projects, they are definitely going to be based in what we've been discussing here. We've been learning so much. I'm excited to continue to learn because there's so much that you opened up here that I know a lot of us are going to continue to sit with and fight with and grapple with in the spirit of all that was planted, all those beautiful seeds. Um, yeah, so we ask everyone to stay tuned for all the amazing work that you are going to continue to keep doing. I, 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 I. Well, that's a wrap on episode seven. We hope this left you all with some new and perhaps old questions to ask ourselves and the Jewish spaces we find ourselves in, whether that be online or offline, religious, secular, places of learning, you name it. We invite you to learn more about these topics, histories, and social justice initiatives Yeshak has been a part of by spending some time with the resources linked in our episode description below. You can also keep up with Yeshak by following them at AfrikaHakam on Instagram. Of course, if you know someone who may be interested in being a guest on the show or simply wants to get a hold of one of us, feel free to email us at neshama.interact at gmail.com or DM us on Instagram at House of Neshama. Until next time, we hope you take care of yourselves and one another. Shalom.